Okay, why don't uh, why don't we get started? Uh, I think uh, give or take a bit, probably about seventy five percent of the uh, classes here, and perhaps there will be a few more that uh, wander in over time. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Cadet. Uh, I've been teaching off and on in this program since the 2003-2004 uh, academic year. In this uh, course, uh, we're going to hopefully cover a lot of areas. Uh, we're going to try to give you both a big picture feel of what's going on uh, by its very nature, uh, international taxation is a combination of, let's say, real business being conducted across borders or investment across borders. Uh, yet, of course, in the sense that that's the forest, there's lots of trees, lots of individual details that uh, you have to get involved in if you are going to uh, practice in this area. Now, this is not exactly different from any other area of taxation, but when there are multiple countries involved, uh, in a sense, the issues and things that clients or the company you're working for or what they're doing uh, sort of multiply in terms of different possible iterations. So uh, I think of it as being sort of like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And I spent my career, which was a bit over 32 years of practice, uh, pretty much waking up every Monday morning being happy that I was going in to see a, another iteration of the jigsaw puzzle because every day was different. Uh, every day was, uh, was really fascinating. So uh, if I can convey a little bit of what I experienced through this class, hopefully you will, uh, you will be uh, uh, bitten by the bug also. Uh, the fact that you're here hopefully indicates you have some interest in the areas. Uh, one thing which is worth saying, uh, this is a U.S. tax class about how the U.S. imposes its tax system on international business, either foreign taxpayers, which is what you've studied, those of you who studied uh, the inbound course last, uh, last quarter, uh, or uh, on uh, uh, U.S. persons who, are, who have some sort of business or investment outside of the United States, which is this course. But the story that comes to mind, uh, you know, when you're mentioning this is, uh, was a good lesson to me, uh, and it's something I'd like to pass on to you. Uh, it's easy, whether you're a student and have a lot of, uh, a lot of pressures on you from different uh, areas, or if you're a practicing professional and you have many clients pulling at you and you know, trying to get your attention for this or that, uh, even though something is not immediately necessary to do, you need to make sure that it gets done reasonably timely. The reason I say that is we were doing some, this is when I was living in Hong Kong. We were doing some work for, a, uh, for the head of a major Thai bank, some estate planning. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we had, were doing some, some work which uh, you know, was relatively important and then we, you know, kept putting it off because, again, it's not, you know, it's not on the front burner. Kept putting it off. Anyway, I see in the newspaper, uh, the South China Morning Post, that this guy's wife had died. And we hadn't done this work yet. I'm thinking, my God, this is terrible. 
Well, it turned out he had more than one wife. <laughs> and <laughs> it didn't matter <laughs> to our work that this particular wife had died. So anyway, it was a lesson to me, which I you know, remember uh, very vividly, uh, that it's, uh, uh, you, know, you don't let things sit on the back burner too long. So uh, I hope that's a uh, useful thing to remember. You know, as I was starting to say at some point a little earlier, you know, there's a forest and there's trees. And we'll try to cover, you know, a lot of the forest in our discussion as well as some of the trees. Uh, but when you're looking at the, you know, how does this thing roughly work so I can understand the big picture? Or if I really want an answer, how do I get down to the tree level? It really means learning how to use the code and regs. Uh, when you are working, if, uh, for example, a client or somebody else comes to you and says, you know, gee, uh, you know, what's the answer to this question? And if you come back with uh, an article that somebody wrote and say, well, gee, here it says this, that ain't good enough. Whoever wrote the article, number one, might be wrong. Number two, and more important and subtle, whatever the author had in mind that he thought he was dealing with, may have different facts or even just maybe small differences from your situation. And as a result, the only way you can be sure that you know, that author's thought is right is to go back and go through the reasoning yourself from the code, the regs, if you have to get into court cases or whatever. But my experience is that the vast majority of things that you are going to work with, the answers will be in the code a great percentage of the time and then often in the regs. So your ability to get comfortable with, to become familiar with, to know where to look within the tax code, is going to be one of the most important things that you can develop. How many of you have looked at the table of contents for the Internal Revenue Code? OK, I, I see enough hands that that's pretty significant. But the majority have not. It's worth taking five minutes and just paging through the table of contents See how it's organized, you know, and it'll, it'll start helping you as you become more familiar with different things, you know, where to find things. Uh, you know, there ought to be something on this, uh, you know, where do I go look? So uh, worth, uh, worth doing. You know, in terms of course goals, uh, you know, I want you to walk away with a some practical understanding of what I will call, let's say, the methodology of how you serve clients or the companies that you're working for. And with that in mind, in this outbound area, obviously, uh, some understanding of the laws, developing skill and applying them. Uh, the most important thing you'll hear me harping over and over again is understanding what the client situation is. Uh, tax advice and broader you know, business legal advice generally has to be based on what a company or investor or whoever your client is is actually doing or wants to do. And uh, again, uh, I'll say it over and over again, how you gather this information, and 
and we'll talk a little more about it later, is extremely important as a part of this. Uh, obviously, analyzing uh, issues, uh, uh, hopefully the, uh, our discussion and your, uh, your work with the uh, various companies on the, the project will, uh, will be helpful for that. And overall, a sensitivity, developing a sensitivity to identify opportunities and risks. So uh, very, uh, uh, very important for you to develop over time. Now, why was there change in December of 2017? Uh, I don't know whether any of you uh, really followed it uh, at the time, but there was a lot of, uh, there were a number of things. That, as I mentioned before, there's a number of major corporations that have been very, very successful at their tax planning, uh, inordinately successful. So, well, what do we mean by this? Okay, uh, and in the next few slides, we'll try to indicate you know, you sometimes use the uh, expression, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. Okay, we're going to look at a bit of the smoke that is out there, the smoke that uh, indicates probably there's some fire somewhere going on. And some of this was the impetus for what happened in December 2017 with the new tax law and what we're going to get into in a little bit more detail in later class sessions. Okay, now this first slide you'll see uh, is Cisco Systems, which is a major company. It might not be quite a household word for, uh, for everybody, but uh, not quite like Apple or Facebook, but uh, Cisco is uh, just as important in, uh, in the area of uh, uh, the internet. You notice how their effective tax rate, which was in the high 30s, even the low 40s, 20 years ago, has a pretty good trend down. Pretty good trend going down. You know, gee, does that mean their business changed? Does that mean, or is this almost solely the result of, uh, call it tax engineering? Uh, over the past uh, years. Now, if we look at the foreign, what Cisco says is it's foreign operations only, not domestic, but it's foreign operations. Notice that the line which goes up and is at 79% in 2010, that line is Profits attributable to foreign activities. On the other hand, if you look at the number of employees, if you look at the, the um, amount of foreign sales, if you look at the amount of property and equipment located outside the United States, relatively speaking, they are all flat. Okay, this is a little, a little bit of smoke, uh, you could say. And over the years, they accumulated foreign earnings, which they did not bring back to the United States. They accumulated foreign earnings, did not bring it back to the United States. That from the year 2000 to the year 2010, you know, climbed astronomically. So uh, at 2010, uh, 30, roughly $31 billion. Now, uh, if you've seen any of the numbers for uh, Apple, uh, they were like $250 billion in 2016, 2017, something like that. So these amounts were just skyrocketing. And notice especially after, 20, after 2004, uh, the upward tra trajectory was particularly strong. Why? 
In 2004, there was something called the American, I think it was American Jobs Act. Uh, that may not be the proper name, but it's something like that. And essentially what happened there was Congress gave a one-time encouragement to bring money back to the United States. Instead of being taxed at 35 percent, it would only be taxed at five and a quarter percent. So Congress, of course, said, we're never going to do this again. You know, how reliable is the word of Congress on something like this? So immediately, everybody and their mother saw this as justification and legitimizing what they had been doing in past years to push more earnings outside the United States. And as a result, they increased the aggressive nature of what they were doing. And by 2009, in fact, John Chambers, who was the, the head of Cisco, if I remember correctly, uh, he was already lobbying for a repeat of, the, uh, of this uh, holiday, so to speak. And as you'll see later when we get to it, uh, this uh, low beneficial rate, uh, higher than five and a quarter, but uh, low beneficial rate eventually found its way into the December 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. These couple of statements are from a 2018 study uh, that is on the web, is on the course website. Uh, the estimate is that 40 percent of the profits of multinationals uh, in 2015 were shifted out of the countries in which they were earned and into primarily tax havens or other low tax countries. And that was roughly 600 billion in profits. And if you think about, let's say, a 35 percent tax rate, okay, that's give or take a bit around 200 billion of tax. Okay, uh, and uh, Ireland being the number one shifting destination, why is Ireland number one? Anybody remember which company uh, has its? Uh, it has its special Irish structure. I mean, many companies have Irish structures, but Apple. yeah, Apple. Apple has been uh, yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, how many Apple computers can I see in the uh, uh, in here? One, two, three, four. Uh, maybe there's more. Anyway, the point is they've been very successful. Uh, and when you read the uh, when you read the introduction to the uh, to the project, uh, you'll see that uh, I included uh, uh, something from the Apple hearings uh, indicating about, about what one senator, if I remember correctly, a Republican senator, uh, had to say about the uh, let us say the morality of uh, what Apple was doing. So. Uh, in any case, Apple was, has been very successful at this. And uh, one thing that was kind of interesting, for each dollar of tax paid to a tax haven, they were able to calculate, let's say, again, on a global, cumulative, economic, uh, economically reasonable basis, that $5 were avoided in high-tax countries. And, and this has been, again, a very political thing, with especially within the European Union, that some number of countries, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and so on, I have over the years, in a sense, been promoting policies which benefit them in a way a little, but that very significantly hurt their neighbors. So this has been a political aspect of this this uh, thing. Uh, yes? You have to look, in a sense, at the laws of each tax haven or low tax country. But um, uh, from, a, and we'll get into more 
detail with some examples and so on as we uh, get into later, uh, later sessions. But uh, in general, some countries either have zero income tax at all and just, in a sense, sell, uh, sell shell companies and uh, they earn, in a sense, some administration fees for uh, local companies to uh, manage uh, those shell companies. Uh, or in a case like, uh, like Ireland or Luxembourg, they have a tax structure, but they allow it to be used with special rulings, which may be allowed deductions for imputed interest, or they allow back-to-back -back arrangements where, okay, interest income comes in or royalty income comes in, and then there's an interest expense or a royalty expense going off to some other related party. So there are ways to end up with a low effective tax rate in a country that has a real tax. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, it's the equivalent of uh, a tax haven with uh, you know, almost no tax. So uh, Luxembourg uh, uh, has been particularly uh, let's say uh, maligned, maybe maligned is not the word since there's some truth to what's there. Uh, does anybody, uh, uh, has anybody heard of what was referred to as Lux Leaks? Okay, uh, uh, a, an employee of one of the major accounting firms, uh, I guess uh, was had sufficient indigestion about what he was doing in the Luxembourg office of that firm that he leaked uh, through the International Consortium of Investigated Journalists uh, a great number of tax rulings and they are now on the internet able to be searched and you can look through them to see what sort of silly things there were. Uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, there was a state aid investigation of McDonald's, which showed that a major part of this particular thing that the European Commission was looking at was uh, a ruling given by Luxembourg that basically allowed McDonald's to say, we're not doing anything in Luxembourg because we're operating through a permanent establishment in the United States and another branch in Switzerland. And the United States looks at it, the same factual situation, and either the United States, uh, well, the United States didn't say anything public, uh, but maybe the IRS auditors on uh, McDonald's, maybe they looked at it, maybe they didn't, but they didn't look at this Luxembourg mem group member of McDonald's and say that it was conducting business in, in uh, the United States uh, and as a result of not saying that, they didn't tax it. So Luxembourg gave a ruling that said even though uh, this Luxembourg uh, McDonald's company is saying we're not taxable in Luxembourg because we're subject to tax in the United States, and you know, by the way, the United States isn't actually taxing us. Uh, you know, there was an obvious inconsistency here. So this was the subject of this European Commission state aid investigation. If some of you have a particular interest in McDonald's, let me know and I'll let you know where to look for this, because it, it makes some interesting reading and especially considering that a lot of you have just finished 515, T515, the inbound course, you might scratch your head and say, well, gee, why isn't that Luxembourg company taxable in the United States based on the facts they're giving? You know, does the IRS not have enough time to properly audit this thing, or do they not have people working on McDonald's that 
understand these things? You know, who knows? Um, uh, I've written a number of articles on these subjects, so I, I have some questions in my mind as to why we haven't seen the effectively connected income rules applied to some of these structures. But, you know, that's a story for another day. Okay, these are just a couple, again, from the standpoint of trying to understand the big picture and uh, the background to uh, the December 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Notice that this is profitability of foreign versus local firms looking at the percentage of compensation of employees. In other words, pre-tax corporate profits as a percentage of the compensation of employees. So uh, we notice that, speaking of Puerto Rico, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Puerto Rico is tops. And uh, uh, notice the relative uh, profitability of foreign firms that are operating in Puerto Rico versus indigenous Puerto Rican firms that are just owned locally and operated locally. Now, I don't know what percentage, but a good, percent, a good portion of this is going to be Microsoft. Because Microsoft has been known for having a Puerto Rican operation and uh, is Right now, the, uh, there's been a very acrimonious battle between Microsoft and the IRS, specifically about the transfer of technology from the United States to Microsoft, uh, Puerto Rico. And of course, notice when we get over to some of the major countries, which would be countries where there are real operations and real customers, Italy, Germany, France, Japan, Spain, UK, Australia, US. There, notice that the uh, profitability as a percentage uh, compensation of employees, that percentage is higher for local firms than it is for foreign firms. OK, this is a bit of smoke indicating that you know, gee, there's some consistency here on aggregate numbers. Again, looking over here one, once more, pre-tax profits of affiliates of U.S. multinationals, percentage of compensation of employees, tax haven affiliates have this higher level of profits to compensation in comparison with non-haven affiliates. So again, you know, there's some consistency in these aggregate numbers. But we don't practice tax on aggregate numbers. We practice tax client by client, transaction by transaction, group member by group member. In terms of our real practice, we have to get into the details. But we also need to understand the big picture. OK, cumulative, cumulatively by 2017, two and a half trillion of accumulated offshore profits. And again, for those of you who followed the news at the time, uh, the theory was uh, in the minds of the uh, people behind the tax bill that we have to do something that will allow this money to be brought back home because if we do, then uh, there will be all this wonderful investment in the United States. And we'll talk later as to whether uh, that seems to have happened or not. And uh, in terms of just a listing of companies, uh, <coughs> Here's, notice the number in the middle is cash held overseas and Apple about 250 million, uh, I'm sorry, 250 billion roughly and uh, 
going down from there. Microsoft, a uh, distant second. Cisco Systems, which I used as an example a little earlier, a uh, more distant third, and then a lot of others.